Moby Dick, chapters 97 to 100. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 97 to 100. Chapter 97 The Lamp. Had you descended from the Pequod's triworks to the Pequod's forecastle, where the off duty watch were sleeping, for one single moment you would have almost thought you were standing in some illuminated shrine of canonized kings and counsellors. There they lay in their triangular oaken vaults, each mariner a chiseled muteness, a score of lamps flashing upon his hooded eyes. In merchantmen, oil for the sailor is more scarce than the milk of queens. To dress in the dark, to eat in the dark, and stumble in darkness to his pallet, this is his usual lot. But the whaleman, as he seeks the food of light, so he lives in light. He makes his berth an Aladdin's lamp, and lays him down to it, so that in the pitchous night the ship's black hull still houses an illumination. See with what entire freedom the whaleman takes his handful of lamps, often but old bottles and vials, though, to the copper cooler at the triworks, and replenishes them there as mugs of ale at a vat. He burns, too, the purest of oils in its unmanufactured and therefore unvitiated state, a fluid unknown to solar, lunar, or astral contrivances ashore, it is as sweet as early grass butter in April. He goes and hunts for his oil, so as to be sure of its freshness and genuineness, even as the traveler on the prairie hunts up his own supper of game. Chapter 98 Stowing Down and Clearing Up Already it has been related how the great Leviathan is afar off descried from the masthead, how he is chased over the watery moors, and slaughtered in the valleys of the deep, how he is then towed alongside and beheaded, and how, on the principle which entitled the headsman of old to the garments in which the beheaded was killed, his great padded surtout becomes the property of his executioner, how in due time he is condemned to the pots, and like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his spermaceti, oil, and bone pass unscathed through the fire. But now it remains to conclude the last chapter of this part of the description by rehearsing, singing if I may, the romantic proceeding of decanting off his oil into the casks and striking them down into the hold, where once again Leviathan returns to his native profundities, sliding along beneath the surface as before, but, alas, never more to rise and blow. While still warm, the oil, like hot punch, is received into the six-barrel casks, and while, perhaps, the ship is pitching and rolling this way and that in the midnight sea, the enormous casks are slewed round and headed over, end for end, and sometimes perilously scoot across the slippery deck like so many landslides, till at last manhandled and stayed in their course, and all round the hoops rap-rap go as many hammers as can play upon them, for now ex officio every sailor is a cooper. At length, when the last pint is casked and all is cool, then the great hatchways are unsealed, the bowels of the ship are thrown open, and down go the casks to their final rest in the sea. This done, the hatches are replaced and hermetically closed, like a closet walled up. In the sperm fishery, this is perhaps one of the most remarkable incidents in all the business of whaling. One day the planks stream with freshets of blood and oil. On the sacred quarter-deck, enormous masses of the whale's head are profanely piled, great rusty casks lie about as in a brewery yard, the smoke from the triworks is besooted all the bulwarks, the mariners go about suffused with unctuousness, the entire ship seems great leviathan himself, while on all hands the din is deafening. But a day or two after, you look about you and prick your ears in this selfsame ship, and were it not for the tell-tale boats and triworks, you would all but swear you trod some silent merchant vessel with a most scrupulously neat commander. 
The unmanufactured sperm oil possesses a singularly cleansing virtue. This is the reason why the decks never look so white as just after what they call an affair of oil. Besides, from the ashes of the burned scraps of the whale, a potent lye is readily made, and whenever any adhesiveness from the back of the whale remains clinging to the side, that lye quickly exterminates it. Hands go diligently along the bulwarks, and with buckets of water and rags restore them to their full tidiness. The soot is brushed from the lower rigging. All the numerous implements which have been in use are likewise faithfully cleansed and put away. The great hatch is scrubbed and placed upon the triworks, completely hiding the pots. Every cask is out of sight, all tackles are coiled in unseen nooks, and when, by the combined and simultaneous industry of almost the entire ship's company, the whole of this conscientious duty is at last concluded, then the crew themselves proceed to their own ablutions, shift themselves from top to toe, and finally issue to the immaculate deck, fresh and all aglow, as bridegroom new leaped from out of the daintiest Holland. Now, with elated step, they pace the planks in twos and threes, and humorously discourse of parlors, sofas, carpets, and fine cambrics, propose to mat the deck, think of having hanging to the top, object not to taking tea by moonlight on the piazza of the forecastle. To hint to such musked mariners of oil and bone and blubber were little short of audacity. They know not the thing you distantly allude to. Away, and bring us napkins. But mark, aloft there, at the three mastheads, stand three men intent on spying out more whales, which, if caught, infallibly will again soil the old oaken furniture, and drop at least one small grease spot somewhere. Yes, and many is the time when, after the severest uninterrupted labors which know no night, continuing straight through for ninety-six hours, when from the boat, where they have swelled their wrists with all day rowing on the line, they only step to the deck to carry vast chains, and heave the heavy windlass, and cut and slash, yea, and in their very sweatings to be smoked and burned anew by the combined fires of the equatorial sun and the equatorial triworks. When, on the heels of all this, they have finally bestirred themselves to cleanse the ship, and make a spotless dairy room of it, Many is the time the poor fellows, just buttoning the necks of their clean frocks, are startled by the cry of, There she blows! And away they fly to fight another whale, and go through the whole weary thing again. Ugh, oh, my friends, but this is man-killing! Yet this is life, for hardly have we mortals, by long toilings, extracted from this world's vast bulk its small but valuable sperm, and then with weary patience cleansed ourselves from its defilements, and learned to live here in clean tabernacles of the soul, hardly is this done when, there she blows, the ghost is spouted up, and away we sail to fight some other world, and go through young life's old routine again. Oh, the metempsychosis! Oh, Pythagoras, that in bright Greece two thousand years ago did die, so good, so wise, so mild. I sailed with thee along the Peruvian coast last voyage, and, foolish as I am, taught thee, a green, simple boy, how to splice a rope. Chapter 99 The Doubloon Ere now it has been related how Ahab was wont to pace his quarter-deck, taking regular turns at either limit, the binnacle and mainmast, but in the multiplicity of other things requiring narration, it has not been added how that sometimes in these walks, when most plunged in his mood, he was wont to pause in turn at each spot, and stand there strangely eyeing the particular object before him. When he halted before the binnacle, with his glance fastened on the pointed needle in the compass, that glance shot like a javelin with the pointed intensity of his purpose. And when resuming his walk, he again paused before the mainmast, then, as the same riveted glance fastened upon the riveted gold coin there, he still wore the same aspect of nailed firmness, only dashed with a certain wild longing, 
if not hopefulness. But one morning, turning to pass the doubloon, he seemed to be newly attracted by these strange figures and inscriptions stamped on it, as though now, for the first time, beginning to interpret for himself, in some monomaniac way, whatever significance might lurk in them. And some certain significance lurks in all things, else all things are little worth, and the round world itself but an empty cipher, except to sell by the cartload as they do hills about Boston to fill up some morass in the Milky Way. Now this doubloon was of purest virgin gold, raked somewhere out of the heart of gorgeous hills, whence east and west over golden sands the headwaters of many a Pactolus flows, and though now nailed amidst all the rustiness of iron bolts and the verdigris of copper spikes, yet untouchable and immaculate to any foulness, it still preserved its Quito glow, nor though placed amongst a ruthless crew and every hour passed by ruthless hands, and through the livelong nights shrouded with thick darkness which might cover any pilfering approach, nevertheless every sunrise found the doubloon where sunset left at last, for it was set apart and sanctified to one awe-striking end, and however wanton in their sailor ways, one and all, the mariners revered it as the white whale's talisman. Sometimes they talked it over in the weary watch by night, wondering whose it was to be at last, and whether he would ever live to spend it. Now those noble golden coins of South America are as medals of the sun and tropic token pieces. Here palms, alpacas, and volcanoes, suns, disks, and stars, ecliptics, horns of plenty, and rich banners waving are in luxuriant profusion stamped, so that the precious gold seems almost to derive an added preciousness and enhancing glories by passing through those fancy mints, so Spanishly poetic. It so chanced that the doubloon of the Pequod was a most wealthy example of these things. On its round border it bore the letters, Republica del Ecuador, Quito. So this bright coin came from a country planted in the middle of the world, and beneath the great equator, and named after it. And it had been cast midway up the Andes, in the unwaning clime that knows no autumn. Zoned by those letters you saw the likeness of three Andes summits, from one a flame, a tower on another, on the third a crowing cock, while arching over all was a segment of the partitioned zodiac, the signs all marked with their usual cabalistics, and the keystone sun entering the equinoctial point at Libra. Before this equatorial coin, Ahab, not unobserved by others, was now pausing. There's something ever egotistical in mountain tops and towers, and all other grand and lofty things. Look here, three peaks as proud as Lucifer. The firm tower, that is Ahab. The volcano, that is Ahab. The courageous, the undaunted and victorious fowl, that too is Ahab. All are Ahab. And this round gold is but the image of the rounder globe, which, like the magician's glass, to each and every man in turn but mirrors back his own mysterious self. Great pains, small gains for those who ask the world to solve them. It cannot solve itself. Methinks now this coined sun wears a ruddy face. But see, aye, he enters the sign of storms, the equinox. And but six months before, he wheeled out of a former equinox at Ares, from storm to storm. So be it then. Born in throes, it is fit that man should live in pains and die in pangs. So be it then. Here's stout stuff for woe to work on. So be it then. No fairy fingers can have pressed the gold, but the devil's claws must have left their moldings there since yesterday, murmured Starbuck to himself, leaning against the bulwarks. The old man seems to read Belshazzar's awful writing. I have never marked the coin inspectingly. He goes below. Let me read. A dark valley between three mighty heaven-abiding peaks. 
that almost seem the trinity in some faint earthly symbol. So in this vale of death God girds us round, and over all our gloom the sun of righteousness still shines a beacon and a hope. If we bend down our eyes, the dark veil shows her mouldy soil, but if we lift them, the bright sun meets our glance halfway to cheer. Yet, oh, the great sun is no fixture. And if, at midnight, we would fain snatch some sweet solace from him, we gaze for him in vain. This coin speaks wisely, mildly, truly, but still sadly to me. I will quit it, lest truth shake me falsely. There now's the old mogul, soliloquized Stubb by the Triworks. He's been twigging it, and there goes Starbuck from the same, and both with faces which I should say might be somewhere within nine fathoms long, and all from looking at a piece of gold, which did I have it now on Negro Hill or in Corlier's Hook, I'd not look at it very long ere spending it. Humph! <laughs> in my poor, insignificant opinion, I regard this as queer. I have seen doubloons before now in my voyagings, your doubloons of old Spain, your doubloons of Peru, your doubloons of Chile, your doubloons of Bolivia, your doubloons of Papillon, with plenty of gold moiderets and pistoles, and joes and half joes and quarter joes. What should there then be in this doubloon of the equator that is so killing wonderful? By Golconda, let me read it once. Hello! Here's signs and wonders truly. That now is what old Bowditch in his epitome calls the Zodiac, and what my almanac below calls Ditto. I'll get the almanac, and as I have heard devils can be raised with Dabol's arithmetic, I'll try my hand at raising a meaning out of these queer curbicues here with the Massachusetts calendar. Here's the book. Let's see now. Signs and wonders, and the sun, he's always among them. Hem, hem, here they are, here they go, all alive, Aries or the ram, Taurus or the bull, and Jiminy, here's Gemini himself, or the twins, well, the sun he wheels among them, aye, here on the coin, he's just crossing the threshold, between two of the twelve sitting rooms, all in a ring, book, you lie there, the fact is, you books must know your places, you do to give us the bare words and facts, but we come in to supply the thoughts. That's my small experience, so far as the Massachusetts calendar and Bowditch's navigator and de Bull's arithmetic go. Signs and wonders, eh? Pity if there is nothing wonderful in signs and significant in wonders. There's a clue somewhere. Wait a bit. Hist! Hark! By Jove! I have it! Look you, doubloon! Your zodiac here is the life of man in one round chapter, and now I'll read it off straight out of the book. Come, almanac. To begin, there's Ares, or the ram, lecherous dog, he begets us. Then Taurus, or the bull, he bumps us the first thing. Then Gemini, or the twins, that is, virtue and vice, we try to reach virtue. When lo, comes Cancer the crab and drags us back. And here, going from virtue, Leo, a roaring lion, lies in the path. He gives a few fierce bites and surly dabs with his paw. We escape and hail Virgo, the virgin. That's our first love. We marry and think to be happy, for I, when pop comes Libra or the scales, happiness weighed and found wanting. And while we are very sad about that, Lord, how we suddenly jump as Scorpio or the scorpion stings us in the rear. We are curing the wound when wang come the arrows all around. Sagittarius or the archer is amusing himself. As we pluck out the shafts, stand aside. Here's the battering ram, Capricornus or the goat. Full tilt he comes rushing and headlong we are tossed when Aquarius or the water bearer pours out his whole deluge and drowns us. And to wind up with Pisces, or the fishes, we sleep. There's a sermon now, writ in high heaven, and the sun goes through it every year, and yet comes out of it all alive and hearty. Jollily he, aloft there, wheels through toil and trouble, and so, alo here, does jolly stop? Ah, jolly's the word for I. Adieu, doubloon, but stop. 
here comes little King Post. Dodge round the try works. Now, and let's hear what he'll have to say. There, he's before it. He'll out with something presently. So, so, he's beginning. I see nothing here but a round thing made of gold, and whoever raises a certain whale, this round thing belongs to him. So what's all this staring been about? It is worth sixteen dollars, that's true. And at two cents the cigar, that's, uh, nine hundred and sixty cigars. I won't smoke dirty pipes like Stubb, but I like cigars. And here's nine hundred and sixty of them. So here goes Flask aloft to spy him out. Shall I call that wise or foolish now? If it be really wise, it has a foolish look to it. Yet if it be really foolish, then it has a sort of wiseish look to it. But a vast, here comes our old Manxman, the old hearse driver he must have been, that is, before he took to the sea. He luffs up before the doubloon, hello, and goes round the other side of the mast. Why, there's a horseshoe nailed on that side. And now he's back again. What does that mean? Hark, he's muttering, voice like an old worn-out coffee mill. Prick ears and listen. If the white whale be raised, it must be in a month and a day when the sun stands in some one of these signs. I've studied signs, and know their marks. They were taught me two score years ago by an old witch in Copenhagen. Now, in what sign will the sun then be? The horseshoe sign. For there it is right opposite the gold. And what's the horseshoe sign? The lion is the horseshoe sign, the roaring and devouring lion. Ship, old ship, my old head shakes to think of thee. Mm, there's another rendering now, but still one text. All sorts of men in one kind of world, you see. Dodge again, here comes Queequeg, all tattooing. Looks like the signs of the Zodiac himself. What says the cannibal? As I live, he's comparing notes. Looking at his thigh bone, thinks the sun is in the thigh, or in the calf, or in the bowels, I suppose, as the old women talk surgeon's astronomy in the back country. And by Jove, he's found something there in the vicinity of his thigh. I guess it's Sagittarius, or the archer. No, he don't know what to make of the doubloon. He takes it for an old button off some king's trousers. But aside again, here comes that ghost devil, Fadala, tail coiled out of sight as usual, oakum in the toes of his pumps as usual. What does he say with that look of his? Ah, only makes a sign to the sign, and bows himself. There is a sun on the coin. Fire worshipper, depend upon it. Ho! Oh, more and more. This way comes Pip. Poor boy. Would he had died, or I? He's half horrible to me. He, too, has been watching all these interpreters, myself included. And look now, he comes to read, with that unearthly idiot face. Stand away again, and hear him. Hark! I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Upon my soul, he's been studying Murray's grammar, improving his mind, poor fellow. But what's that he says now? Hist! I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Why, he's getting it by heart. Hist! Again. I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Well, that's funny. And I, you, and he, and we, ye, and they, are all bats, and I'm a crow especially when I stand atop of this pine tree here. Caw, 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 caw. Ain't I a crow? And where's the scarecrow? There he stands, two bones stuck into a pair of old trousers and two more poked into the sleeves of an old jacket. Wonder if he means me. Complimentary. Poor lad, I could go and hang myself. Anyway, for the present, I'll quit Pip's vicinity. I can stand the rest, for they have plain wits, but he's too crazy witty for my sanity. So, so, I leave him muttering. 
here's the ship's navel, this doubloon here, and they are all on fire to unscrew it. But unscrew your navel, and what's the consequence? Then again, if it stays here, that is ugly too, for when aught's nailed to the mast, it's a sign that things grow desperate. Ha! Ha! Old Ahab, the white whale, he'll nail you. This is a pine tree. My father, in old Tallinn County, cut down a pine tree once, and found a silver ring grown over in it, some old darkie's wedding ring. How did it get there? And so they'll say in the resurrection, when they come to fish up this old mast, and find a doubloon lodged in it, with bedded oysters for the shaggy bark. Ah, oh, the gold, the precious, precious gold. The green miser'll hoard you soon. Hish, hish. God goes mong the worlds blackberrying. Cook, ho, cook, and cook us. Jenny, hey, 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 Jenny, Jenny, and get your hoe cake done. Chapter 100 Leg and Arm The Pequod of Nantucket meets the Samuel Enderby of London. Ship ahoy! Has seen the white whale! So cried Ahab, once more hailing a ship showing English colors, bearing down under the stern. Trumpet to mouth, the old man was standing in his hoisted quarter boat, his ivory leg plainly revealed to the stranger captain, who was carelessly reclining in his own boat's bow. He was a darkly tanned, burly, good-natured, fine-looking man of sixty or thereabouts, dressed in a spacious roundabout that hung round him in festoons of blue pilot cloth, and one empty arm of this jacket streamed behind him like the broidered arm of a hussar's surcoat. Has seen the white whale! See you this! And withdrawing it from the folds that had hidden it, he held up a white arm of sperm whale bone, terminating in a wooden head like a mallet. Man my boat! cried Ahab, impetuously, and tossing about the oars near him. Stand by to lower! In less than a minute, without quitting his little craft, he and his crew were dropped to the water, and were soon alongside of the stranger. But here a curious difficulty presented itself. In the excitement of the moment, Ahab had forgotten that since the loss of his leg, he had never once stepped on board of any vessel at sea but his own, and then it was always by an ingenious and very handy mechanical contrivance peculiar to the Pequod, and a thing not to be rigged and shipped in any other vessel at a moment's warning. Now it is no very easy matter for anybody, except those who are almost hourly used to it like whalemen, to clamber up a ship's side from a boat on the open sea, for the great swells now lift the boat high up toward the bulwarks, then instantaneously drop it halfway down to the kelson. So, deprived of one leg, and the strange ship of course being altogether unsupplied with the kindly invention, Ahab now found himself abjectly reduced to a clumsy landsman again, hopelessly eyeing the uncertain changeful height he could hardly hope to attain. It has before been hinted, perhaps, that every little untoward circumstance that befell him, and which indirectly sprang from his luckless mishap, almost invariably irritated or exasperated Ahab. And in the present instance, all this was heightened by the sight of the two officers of the strange ship leaning over the side, by the perpendicular ladder of nailed cleats there, and swinging towards him a pair of tastefully ornamented man-ropes for at first they did not seem to bethink them that a one-legged man must be too much of a cripple to use their sea banisters. But this awkwardness only lasted a minute, because the strange captain, observing at a glance how affairs stood, cried out, I see, I see! A vast heaving there! Jump, boys, and swing over the cutting tackle! As good luck would have it, they had had a whale alongside a day or two previous, and the great tackles were still aloft, and the massive curved blubber hook, now clean and dry, was still attached to the end. This was quickly lowered to Ahab, who, at once comprehending it all, slid his solitary thigh into the curve of the hook, it was like sitting in the fluke of an anchor or the crotch of an apple tree, and then giving the word held himself fast, and at the same time also helped to hoist his own weight by pulling hand over hand upon one of the running parts of the tackle. 
Soon he was carefully swung inside the high bulwarks and gently landed upon the capstan head. With his ivory arm frankly thrust forth in welcome, the other captain advanced, and Ahab, putting out his ivory leg and crossing the ivory arm like two swordfish blades, cried out in his walrus way, Aye, aye, hearty. Let us shake bones together, an arm and a leg, an arm that never can shrink, do you see, and a leg that never can run. Where didst thou see the white whale? How long ago? The white whale, said the Englishman, pointing his ivory arm towards the east, and taking a rueful sight along it, as if it had been a telescope. There I saw him, on the line last season. And he took that arm off, did he? asked Ahab, now sliding down from the capstan, and resting on the Englishman's shoulder as he did so. Aye, he was the cause of it at least, and that leg too? Spin me the yarn, said Ahab. How was it? It was the first time in my life that I ever cruised on the line, began the Englishman. I was ignorant of the white whale at that time. Well, one day we lowered for a pod of four or five whales, and my boat fastened to one of them. A regular circus horse he was, too, that went milling and milling round so, that my boat's crew could only trim dish by setting all their sterns on the outer gunwale. Presently up breaches from the bottom of the sea a bouncing great whale, with a milky white head and hump, all crow's feet and wrinkles. It was he! It was he! cried Ahab, suddenly letting out his suspended breath. And harpoons sticking in near his starboard fin. Aye, aye, they were mine, my irons, cried Ahab exultingly. But on! Give me a chance, then, said the Englishman good-humouredly. Well, this old great-grandfather, with a white head and hump, runs all a foam into the pod, and goes to snapping furiously at my fast line. Aye, I see. Wanted to part it. Free the fast fish. An old trick. I know him. How it was exactly, continued the one-armed commander, I do not know, but in biting the line it got foul of his teeth caught there somehow, but we didn't know it then, so that when we afterwards pulled on the line, bounce we came plump onto his hump, instead of the other whales that went off to windward, all fluking. Seeing how matters stood, and what a noble great whale it was, the noblest and biggest I ever saw, sir, in my life, I resolved to capture him, in spite of the boiling rage he seemed to be in, and thinking the haphazard line would get loose, or the tooth it was tangled to might draw, for I have a devil of a boat's crew for a pull on a whale line. Seeing all this, I say, I jumped into my first mate's boat. Now, Mr. Mounttop's here. And by the way, Captain, Mounttop, Mounttop, the captain. As I was saying, I jumped into Mounttop's boat, which, do you see, was gunnel and gunnel with mine. Then, snatching the first harpoon, let this old great-grandfather have it. But, Lord, look you, sir. Hearts and souls alive, man. The next instant, in a jiff, I was blind as a bat, both eyes out, all befogged and bedeadened with black foam, the whale's tail looming straight up out of it, perpendicular in the air like a marble steeple. No use sterning all then, but as I was groping at midday, with a blinding sun all crowned jewels, as I was groping, I say, after the second iron to toss it overboard, down comes the tail like a lima tower, cutting my boat in two, leaving each half in splinters, and flukes first the white hump backed through the wreck as though it was all chips. We all struck out. To escape his terrible flailings, I seized hold of my harpoon pole sticking in him, and for a moment clung to that like a sucking fish. But the combing sea dashed me off, and at the same instant the fish, taking one good dart forward, went down in a flash and the barb of that cursed second iron towing along near me caught me here, clapping his hand just below his shoulder. Yes, caught me just here, I say, and bore me down to hell's flames, I was thinking, when, when all of a sudden, thank the good God, the barb ripped its way along the flesh, clear along the whole length of my arm, came out nigh my wrist, and up I floated. And that gentleman there will tell you the rest, uh, by the way, Captain, Dr. Bunger, ship's surgeon. Bunger, my lad, the captain. Now, Bunger boy, 
Spin your part of the yarn." The professional gentleman thus familiarly pointed out had been all the time standing near them with nothing specific visible to denote his gentlemanly rank on board. His face was an exceedingly round but sober one. He was dressed in a faded blue woolen frock or shirt and patched trousers, and had thus far been dividing his attention between a marling spike he held in one hand and a pill-box held in the other, occasionally casting a critical glance at the ivory limbs of the two crippled captains. But at his superior's introduction of him to Ahab, he politely bowed, and straightway went on to do his captain's bidding. "'It was a shocking bad wound,' began the whale-surgeon, "'and taking my advice, Captain Boomer here stood our old Sammy—' "'Samuel Enderby is the name of my ship,' interrupted the one-armed captain, addressing Ahab. "'Go on, my boy.' "'Stood our old Sammy off to the northward to get out of the blazing hot weather there on the line. "'But it was no use. I did all I could, sat up with him nights, "'was very severe with him in the matter of diet.' "'Oh, very severe,' chimed in the patient himself, then suddenly altering his voice, "'drinking hot rum toddies with me every night till he couldn't see to put on the bandages, "'and sending me to bed half seas over about three o'clock in the morning. "'Oh, ye stars, he sat up with me indeed, and was very severe in my diet. "'Oh, a great watcher, and very dietetically severe as Dr. Bunger.' "'Bunger, you dog, laugh out, why don't you? "'You know you're a precious jolly rascal. "'But heave ahead, boy. "'I'd rather be killed by you than kept alive by any other man.' "'My captain, you must have ere this perceived, respected sir,' "'said the imperturbable, godly-looking Bunger, "'slightly bowing to Ahab, "'is apt to be facetious at times. "'He spins us many clever things of that sort.' But I may as well say, en passant, as the French remark, that I myself, that is to say, Jack Bunger, late of the reverend clergy, am a strict, total abstinence man. I never drink. Water! cried the captain. He never drinks it. It's a sort of fits to him. Fresh water throws him into the hydrophobia. But go on, go on with the arm story. Yes, I may as well, said the surgeon coolly. I was about observing, sir, before Captain Boomer's facetious interruption, that, spite of my best and severest endeavors, the wound kept getting worse and worse. The truth was, sir, it was as ugly, gaping a wound as surgeon ever saw, more than two feet and several inches long. I measured it with the lead line. In short, it grew black. I knew what was threatened, and off it came. But I had no hand in shipping that ivory arm there. That thing is against all rule, pointing at it with the marling spike. That is the captain's work, not mine. He ordered the carpenter to make it. Uh, he had that club hammer there put to the end to knock someone's brains out with, I suppose, as he tried mine once. He flies into diabolical passions sometimes. Do you see this dent, sir? Removing his hat and brushing aside his hair and exposing a bowl-like cavity in his skull, but which bore not the slightest scarry trace, nor any token of ever having been a wound. Well, the captain there will tell you how that came here. He knows. No, I don't, said the captain. But his mother did. He was born with it. Oh, you solemn rogue, you, you bunger. Was there ever such another bunger in the watery world? Bunger, when you die, you ought to die in pickle, you dog. You should be preserved to future ages, you rascal. "'What became of the white whale?' now cried Ahab, who thus far had been impatiently listening to this by-play between the two Englishmen. "'Oh!' cried the one-armed captain. "'Oh, yes. Well, after he sounded, we didn't see him again for some time. In fact, as I before hinted, I didn't then know what whale it was that had served me such a trick, till some time afterwards, when coming back to the line, we heard about Moby Dick, as some call him, and then I knew it was he.' Didst thou cross his wake again? Twice. But could not fasten? Didn't want to try to. Ain't one limb enough? What should I do without this other arm? And I'm thinking Moby Dick doesn't bite so much as he swallows. Well then, interrupted Bunger, give him your left arm for bait to get the right. Do you know, gentlemen, 
very gravely and mathematically bowing to each captain in succession, "Do you know, gentlemen, that the digestive organs of the whale are so inscrutably constructed by divine providence that it is quite impossible for him to completely digest even a man's arm? And he knows it, too. So that what you take for the white whale's malice is only his awkwardness. For he never means to swallow a single limb. He only thinks to terrify by faints. But sometimes he is like the old juggling fellow, formerly a patient of mine in Ceylon, that making believe to swallow jackknives, once upon a time let one drop into him in good earnest, and there it stayed for a twelve-month or more. When I gave him an emetic, and he heaved it up in small tacks, do you see? No possible way for him to digest that jackknife and fully incorporate it into his general bodily system. Yes, Captain Boomer, if you are quick enough about it, and have a mind to pawn one arm for the sake of the privilege of giving a decent burial to the other, why, in that case, the arm is yours. Only let the whale have another chance at you shortly, that's all. No thank you, Bunger, said the English captain. He's welcome to the arm he has, since I can't help it, and didn't know him then, but not to the other one. No more white whales for me. I've lowered for him once, and that has satisfied me. There would be great glory in killing him, I know that. And there is a shipload of precious sperm in him. But hark ye, he's best let alone. Don't you think so, Captain? Glancing at the ivory leg. He is, but he will still be hunted for all that. What's best let alone, that accursed thing is not always what least allures. He's all a magnet. How long since thou saw him last? Which way heading? Bless my soul, and curse the foul fiends, cried Bunger, stoopingly walking round Ahab, and like a dog strangely snuffing. This man's blood! Bring the thermometer! It's at the boiling point. His pulse makes these planks beat. Sir, taking a lancet from his pocket and drawing near to Ahab's arm. Avast, roared Ahab, dashing him against the bulwarks. Man the boat. Which way heading? Good God, cried the English captain to whom the question was put. What's the matter? He was heading east, I think. Is your captain crazy? Whispering Vidala. But Fadala, putting a finger on his lips, slid over the bulwark to take the boat's steering oar, and Ahab, swinging the cutting tackle towards him, commanded the ship's sailors to stand by to lower. In a moment he was standing in the boat's stern, and the Manila men were springing to their oars. In vain the English captain hailed him, with back to the stranger ship, and face set like a flint to his own. Ahab stood upright till alongside of the Pequod. End of chapters 97 to 100